Good morning, good afternoon or good evening depending on where you happen to be in this wonderful world that we all live in. I'm delighted to be making a small presentation as part of the Embarcadero Coding Boot Camp 2023. My presentation is going to be a brief, very simple introduction to XML Mapper, a tool that ships with Embarcadero products. Little bit about me. My name is Roger Swan. I started Seagull Controls Limited back in 1981, a long time ago. We do industrial control system design, working for various high tech industries. We're based in the UK, actually in the southwest in Devon. There's my website there. I started writing a similar language for the Motorola MC6800 8 bit microprocessor back in the 80s and um, I've used a lot of Turbo C for MS-DOS which was by Borland which is a forerunner of the Embarcadero products and then I discovered the VCL framework and have been an enthusiastic advocate of Embarcadero products ever since. I still do a fair bit of bare metal um, i.e. no operating system uh, low-level microprocessor control systems design but I spend a lot of time working with Embarcadero C++ and VCL and FireMonkey. I can't believe that my presentation will be so dull that you have spare time but if you're interested and your mind is wandering you might wonder why I called the company Seagull. OK, we're going to talk about the tool XML Mapper. We're going to discuss what it's uh, designed to do and also, as a way of emphasising this, what it, uh, what it definitely doesn't do. We'll talk briefly about XML files and uh, their associated uh, siblings, if you like, uh, the schema files, XSD files. We'll talk about creating a transform and uh, then we'll use that transform to import data using a very simple example. And then we'll talk about converting the data from T client data set to uh, FireDAC uh, components. Actually, we'll use a FireDAC T mem t t FD mem table. Don't worry if you don't understand some of these terms now. That's the point of the demonstration. Hopefully, you'll understand them all by the time we get through. OK, so XML Mapper is an Embarcadero IDE plugin. Uh, it ships with Delphi and C++ and Red Studio. And it's a design time tool. You use it at design time. And you use it to uh, enable you to enable, to enable your applications that you're going to build to work conveniently with data in an XML format. It's available on the Get It Packet Manager, and you'll see that I recommend you make sure you're always using the latest version uh, before you start to use it in earnest, and you can check that using the Get It Packet man Package Manager. Okay, so it, you, it allows you to make conversions between data in XML files and the uh, Embarcadero component T client data set. The T client data set component is available in both VCL and FireMonkey and in fact everything that we talk about in this presentation applies equally to FireMonkey framework based applications or VCL based applications. XML Mapper is not for use at runtime, it's a design time tool. Actually what we're going to do in this demonstration is we're going to use the XML Mapper at design time to create a transformation file and it's the transformation file that we use during uh, for our application at runtime. XMAPA is not new. It's been around for a, a very long time, shipping with the Delphi and C++ IDEs. And unfortunately, it's not especially well documented. And that particularly applies to uh, those of us using the modern recommended technology of FireDAC for our database applications. Because XML Mapper was developed well before FireDAC was um, 
released. None of the documentation refers to using it with FIDO. However, it's very easy to convert from data in the tclient data set to, or at least to, not to convert, but to move it across to FIDAC components. And I will show you an example of that in this presentation. So we're going to use XML Mapper to create this transformation at file at design time. And and it's the transformation file, as I've said, that we will use at runtime. We can also use the XML Mapper tool to check the transformation file. And you'll see that we can actually load in genuine XML file data and confirm that the transformation file is doing what we expect. And having got that transformation file, then I'll show you a very simple demonstration uh, in a runtime application. And that demonstration will be VCL. Uh, based and C, written in C++, um, but there's only a very small number of lines of code in C++, so any Delphi users will be able to look over my shoulder and see exactly what's going on. And I remind you also that, uh, that equally we could have used FireMonkey rather than VCL for this demonstration. You've got your data in an XML file, but you need to know what structure the data in the XML file is uh, going to take. And in, in many cases, perhaps almost all cases, someone will have defined, maybe it's yourself or maybe it's a third party, will have defined how that XML file is going to be structured. And the most common way of doing that is to use a, a schema file, which typically has the extension XSD. So if you take the example I've already referred to of a, of a country's electronic invoicing, the, the, the country will have very accurately specified exactly the structure of an XML electronic invoice. And they will do that by supplying a schema file. The schema file doesn't contain any data. It just contains information about fields that will be in an XML file that complies with the schema. And it may also tell you about fields that are optional. So you may have an XML file with some of the data in it, and the schema file will allow the, the missing data because it knows that's optional. For this reason, when you're gener generating a transformation file, which you want to cover, you want to be sure that it will cover all of a, all possible XML files that you'll fire at it, it's much better to base the transformation on the schema file. If you do have an XML file and you're sure that it contains all the data fields that you will need, then it is possible to base your transformation file directly on that XML file. But this isn't really the recommended route to go. Just to remind you, if you open Tools, Get It Packet Manager, this is what you see and you can see down the bottom here, XML Mapper is listed, and this will be the latest build number. Um, you can find that by selecting IDE plugins as the category to search in. So if you haven't updated to the latest version, you would click on Install and update it. Having got XML Mapper up to the latest version, the way you start it is using, from the IDE tools, an XML mapper. OK, I'm going to run a video that shows how we use the XML mapper to create the transform file. This is XML mapper as it starts. If you go to help about, you can see the version number displayed and it's wise to check that this is the same version as the latest available in the Get It Packing Manager. We're going to create a transform file based on an existing XML schema file, which will typically come as uh, be available from wherever you're getting the XML data from. So I go File, Open. I select Schema Files down here and navigate to the schema file that I wish to open.
you'll see that it reads in the schema file. And over on the left, the left hand pane has two tabs. On the schema view, you can see a tree view of the schema file that we've just read in. On the document view, you have a tree view of the XML file that the schema represents. If we go right click, bring up this menu, we can select all, which will select all the nodes available in the schema. Or we can use these two options to select individual sets of nodes or an individual item. The most common is to that you need all the data that's going to be available to you. So we'll do select all. And it's populated this central pane, central pane with the nodes that we've selected. This central pane also has two tabs and the node properties tab shows properties associated with each of the items in the XML file. So I'm just going to change a couple of these properties because uh, these are all string variables in the sample I've chosen and the default length is a bit small. So I'm going to change this from 31 to 50. And I'm going to do that for each of the string variables. So I'm selecting them over the left here and then editing it. In. Remember, I'm using the node properties tab of this central pane. You'll see that I can also, for example, change the name of the field that the uh, XML data is going to be mapped to, but I'm happy with how it stands at the minute. Having done that, I'm now going to create a data packet from it. So I do that by create data packet from XML. And you'll see that it's created a client data set equivalent from of what we of the XML data that we have. That all looks good. You'll see that these field names it's got here may look a little bit confusing, POIT title. But that's actually the first two characters of the nested data that we have here, or of the hierarchy data, I should use the right term, that we have here. So POIT is here, POIT, and BOIT for books items is here. And if you wanted to, you could change the length of the, uh, of the abbreviation that it uses using this setting here. Having got an equivalent client data set, the next thing I can do is create a transform, which will which is a way of specifying the way it's translating from the XML data that will be coming into a client data set. Um, I can do that up here, but I can also use this button create and test transformation, which is which brings up a little test screen. And you can see here we have the data um, presented as a as a, a database record, and the column titles reflect those that we saw over here name POIT title and because there's no data file at the minute it's populated this with just a, a simple test data of ABC for the strings. We can in fact open an existing XML file to test our transformation so I'm going to do that. It's, uh, I'm going to navigate to where the XML file is and here's one that I have and you'll see that this has now populated it with the with some data so we have in this, in this uh, XML file, we've got the author's name, Roger Swan, not a very famous author, that's me. Uh, a post title, which is XML Mapper is good, and the summary of the post contents tells me that it still needs writing. And a book title, Introduction to XML Mapper, and a ISB number associated with that book. So that all looks like it's working nicely. So now I'm going to save that transform file and later on I'm going to use that in my application. So I do that by save, transform, transformation, and navigate to where I want to save it, save it. And here's, a, here's the file that I want to save. Okay. Okay, so we've got a transformation file 
now and we know that it works with our very simple XML data file for our demonstration. What we need to do now is get that XML data into our FireDAC system so that we can process it, save it to databases, search on it, edit it, whatever. So XML Mapper it generates a transformation file and there we can the comp we can use that in a transform component that transforms the data into a T client data set. T client data sets an older component predates FireDAC and uh, has many similarities to the FireDAC uh, T data set components. It has one other feature though in that it will support nested data sets. So a T client data set field can contain another T client data set. This is not possible in FireDAC. But it's very easy to convert from T client data set data sets into FireDAC data sets. And when you've got when you run across a nested client data set, as you may do in very complex XML file structures, all you have to do is uh, treat the field as a separate table and use exactly the same method of moving the data across as we use for a for a single uh, T client data set. So I'm going to show you a runtime application that uses that transformation file that we've just created. We will use the runtime application to load in the records from the XML data files. Uh, I've got two very simple XML data files to use for my example. And then we'll display that data that gets loaded into the tclient data set. And as part of the same application, I will then also copy that data into a FireDAC mem table, TFD mem table. And in the same application, we'll also display the data that's in the TFD mem table. I think we talk, before we talk about how we do it, it makes good sense to see the uh, simple application in action. So I'm going to run a video that shows just that. This is the application in action. So just to remind you, what we're going to do here is we're going to read in to from an XML file, or actually from two different XML files, which contain each contain a, a data record that we want to, um, in a real life world, we'd want to do some processing on or storing in a database. We read it into a T client data set. And because uh, many people out there will be using Fire DAC, which is the modern way to interface to all ranges of databases. The, I will also demonstrate with this application the conversion from the T client data set to an FD mem, mem table, a FireDAC mem table. And exactly the same principles can be used for any of the FireDAC components once you have it in the mem table. Okay, so when we start the application, this is what we see. If I load in a file, you can see that we've got the same data that we had as we were creating using to test the uh, XML transform that we created using XML Mapper. So here's the author, here's the uh, post title and content, and the book title and ISBN. Now this uh, grid at the top is showing the content of the T client data set that we filled from the uh, XML file using the transform file that we, the transformation file that we generated. There's no actual use of XML Mapper whilst we run this application. It's just using the transformation file that we use the design time tool of XML Mapper to make. The lower grid, this contains the data held in the FT mem table. You'll see that it's the same as the upper grid. So what we've done is we've used our transform to read in an 
an XML file. We've got the data in the T client data set and we're showing it in this upper pane, upper grid. And then we're also then transferring that data to the FireDAC TFD mem table and we're showing the data in the bottom. I've got another XML file with different data in. I can load that in. You'll see that it's updated the, uh, the data in the, both the client data set shown here at the top and also the FD mem table shown here at the bottom. Now I can actually uh, append the records in the FD mem table. So if I now load the original data back in, you'll see that it's loaded it back into the T client data set, but this time it's added it to the TFD mem table uh, as, a, as a new record. And this may be one thing that you'll commonly want to do with data that's presented to you in an XML file from some other source. Okay, so you've seen the application in action. Let's have a look at how we achieve that result. So here's the design time view of the, the main form, the only form in the application. The components along the middle here are all uh, Embarcadero standard, um, standard components used for, used for data manipulation. So there's an, a, a, a TXML transform component and that is does the job of converting data in an XML file into uh, a format ready for the client data set. The, that XML transform file component is uses the XML transform file that we generated at design time um, using XML mapper. That passes its data into a T client data set. And then we display, as, as we saw, the data in the T client data set in this upper DB grid. And to do that, we link the T client data set to a data source component and we link the grid to the data source. But we also want to get the data into FireDAC and we do that using an FD batch move and the FD batch move gets information about what data to move using a, an FD batch move reader and an FD batch move writer. So these three components in the middle are used to take the data from the two client data set and put it in an FD mem table. I've used an FD mem table. Once you've got it in an FD mem table, it's very easy to move it to another FireDAC uh, table. Equally, you could move it directly to another FireDAC data set and an FD query or an FD. Um, there are many components that are derived from FD uh, from a data set. Having got the data into the FD mem table, we then want to display it in this bottom DB grid and we do that by linking the data to a data source and then linking this grid to the data source. So this is exactly the same approach as we use to move the data to the top grid, but this time we're moving the data down to the bottom grid. Let's have a look at some code. Okay, here's a subset of my code and I'll uh, just define a few string constants. I've, I've, I've got all my um, data in a directory and I define two different source, source uh, file names. Uh, these are the XML data files um, and I've just called them XML, source XML1 and source XML2. And I also have the transform file that we created by using the Excel mapper and I, th this is a full name of the transform file here. And this is a key line. So we take the XML transform component, it has a property called transformation file, and we load it with the transform file. 
And this line needs to be done before we use the XML transform component. It could be used done at any time. It could actually be done at design time if you're only going to use the XML transform component for a single um, for a single uh, XML incoming XML file. I you only ever have one transformation file. But it, it's much more likely in a real world application that you'll have several transform files to accommodate XML data coming from different places. So you just need to set up the transform file to match the data you're going to use it with before you use the transform component. And when I press the load button to load in the data from the source file, load button one loads in the data from the XML file number one sample data I've got. And I used a function to do that. And what that does is it passes the name of the XML file I want to load from. And we simply have a, we set the property of the transform component. We set the property source XML file to the file name that's containing the XML data we want to transform. And then all we do is we take the client data set and we set the XML data in the client data set equal to the XML transform component data. And when we do that, the client data set will magically contain the data that's been transformed from the XML file that we have started with. Job done. Not quite, because we also want to get it into the FireDAC table, if you recall. So I'm going to, if, if we're not using append, and providing the fire deck table is empty the very very first time it won't we run it won't be it won't active i should say it won't be active then we clear the fd mem tab table for whatever old data it has and then all we do is we use the batch move component and we just execute it we've set the batch move up component up at design time if you recall to point to the client data set and to move the data to the fd mem table so that call of execute is all we need to do to get the data across. That's the only code there is. So I'll just go through how we set some of these components up. So uh, when you click on a component or in the VCL IDE, you have an object inspector visible and that's where you set properties and indeed assign events to the components. So on this screen, I've, I've um, snapshotted the object inspectors for the components that we're talking about. So this is the bit that updates the top grid. So we, we need to take the data from the T client data set and we need to get it into display to display it in this top grid. So for the data source one component, all we do is we set the data set for the data source one component to our client data set. That links the data source to the client data set. All the other settings are their default settings. And for the DB grid one, which is the actual display component up here, all we have to do is set the data source to our data source one component. That links the DB grid to data source one. So with these and all the other settings are left at their default settings. So by just setting those two values at design time, we provide this link and the data in the client data set is all is magically displayed in this grid. Now we'll talk about the three components that move the data or copy the data from the client data set into the FD mem table. So that's these three components across the middle. So the data set reader all we have to do for that is set up the di link it link it to the client data set. So we make a link between these two components by setting the data set property of the data set reader to client data set one. The FD batch move. All we have to do here to set up uh, is to set the reader to the data set reader and to set the writer, which is where the data is going to be moved to to the data set writer. The rest of the values here are left at default values. 
And then for the dataset writer, we make the final link between the dataset writer and the FD mem table by setting the dataset to FD mem table here. So these design properties here make a link between the client dataset and the reader, between the reader and the batch move component, the batch move component and the dataset writer, and then finally the dataset writer to the FD mem table. So you'll recall that all we do in the code to, to, to affect this moving of data from client dataset to FD mem table is called the execute method of this HD FD batch move component. And all these design time settings ensure that that simple one line of code is all we need to do to move the data across. It's the kind of thing that makes you realize FireDAX really good. And finally, we need to display the data in the FD mem table onto this grid. And this is exactly the same mechanism as we use to get the data onto the top grid. It's doing the same job. So for the data source 2, all we do is we set the data set that it's linked to to the FD mem table. And for the DB grid, all we do is set the data source to data source 2. So that forms the link for the data moving in this direction to the display component. If you feel a need to actually get hold of the source code and run it yourself, it's available on a public github.com uh, repository, uh, that long uh, URL there. Feel free to go and have a look at it. The XML files, the schema files uh, are all up there too. Okay, if anybody was wondering, it's called Seagull. It's logic spelt backwards, so there we go. And uh, I never mentioned it before, I tried to keep it under covers, but when I'm not programming, my other hobby is playing the French horn, and there's a picture of me playing my natural horn. Great. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch the presentation. I hope it's given you a feel for what XML Mapper can and can't do. And I hope it's shown you how easy it is to get from tClient dataset components into the FireDAC framework. There's loads of other good stuff in the Coding Bootcamp 2023. So make sure you keep watching uh, my colleagues' other videos. And yep, that says it all. Thanks for watching. Uh, the good news is that uh, Roger is with us uh, live. Hello, Roger. Hi, everybody. Whee, there you go. Oh, You're, there uh, we go. Right I'm well, actually, well, that, See, actually I, on I, the I, picture, yep. You mentioned that you had your Embarcadero MVP show. Can you just do that a little bit? We yeah. Can oh, it's uh, backwards. You know, yeah. I, I, have to, I have to say something about this. All the MVPs, or the majority of the MVPs, got an MVP shirt. The only one that never got an MVP shirt was me. I never got one. I have my own um, suspicion there, Ian. I seem to recall, uh, when they came yeah. out, they were only available in medium or small for some reason. And I went for a medium, uh, and the medium is really small. <laughs> Yeah, so, I would need like I'm six foot two. Just, I'm yeah, a pretty yeah. big guy, so uh, yeah. yeah. But it's nice yeah. to have, and um, yeah, it keeps you warm on a winter's night. Well, when it, when it used to be a DJ back in the days, I, I remember going to one wedding, and I was standing behind the record decks, and everybody kept walking past me and giving me funny looks, and I'm like, "What's the problem? What have I done?" And I I didn't have my glasses on, and I had no beard. I looked like this, you know, shaved hair and all the rest of it. And uh, eventually someone came up to me. This was at a wedding in a hotel. And they said, can you tell me when the DJ is arriving? I said, I am the DJ. She said, we thought you were security. <laughs> she thought I was a bouncer. <laughs> I am six foot two. So, you know, I'm a little bit intimidated sometimes. But uh, look at my smiley face. How could anybody be scared of that? That's, uh, that's how it is. Um, so the good news is... Um, uh, you kept asking me how many numbers that were there. Nobody went, and in fact, we gained more viewers. So you, you did good, uh, despite XML being uh, not the most thrilling, exciting subject uh, compared to 
I don't know, space computers or something like that, which is the ones I always go for. I always go for the sexy ones and uh, the things that get people uh, uh, going, ooh, and stuff like that. Um, really good explanation. Um, we did get um, a couple of questions, and actually more came up during the conversation. Uh, what's uh, Patrick saying there? Yeah, Miguel uh, Angel Moreno, who actually is also an MVP, and uh, also worked on this project, and I think has got a presentation at some point, Miguel, haven't you? Yes, uh, Miguel's got another one on the August the 17th about exactly the same subject. So um, if people don't know how uh, how uh, XML Mapper does works by the end of this, this week, then we may as well just all give up and go home. So there you go. Um, Roger, you're going to type your... Um, your code. Uh, can you grab your um, URL so that I can paste it into the the chat at some point? Because you won't be able to uh, put it in the chat. It will stop you from posting links. Oh, so. Okay. Yeah. I did. Uh, did I thought I'd send you that, but yeah, I can. Let me just. Uh, uh, no, I, no, I can. I can do it. I can do it. Trust me. Um, oh, you can. Okay. Well, go ahead. Good luck. <laughs> uh, usually, when you uh, when guests type in uh, URLs, some YouTube or something monster uh, wipes it out. But good luck. So, so um, we did have a little bit of a chat um, behind the scenes about, uh, and because this was a question that someone asked about, oh, is there an equivalent thing for JSON mapper? Uh, and the answer is uh, no, there isn't uh, one uh, at the moment. There have been some suggestions that there might be at some point in the future. And the disclaimer we always give is that anything that we might say about future um, facilities or uh, features in any of the products is um, subject to change until the general availability of the product. Uh, we can't possibly say whether something will come in or not. And actually, Miguel is going to send me the repository URL uh, via um, Skype. Yeah, I've, I, there we are. I've just sent it to you, I believe. You should find that, Ian, on the private chat. Oh, there we go. OK. Yeah, I shall yeah. shun Miguel's and make him feel very unhappy. Um, <laughs> there you go. So that is the Git repository. Thank you, uh, Miguel. I'm glad you're listening as well. And I'll be talking to you uh, later on this week. Um, yeah, so the, the question was about whether there was an equivalent thing for JSON, um, because JSON is obviously quite an important um, a product. At the moment, there, there isn't one. But you made some very good points about um, JSON that you could actually do it in different ways. Is that right? There's been there's been quite a lot of uh, uh, webinars from Embarcadero on the on the stuff they introduced. I think in in eleven or might even have been ten, yeah. allowing you to pass the JSON uh, the JSON text files of JSON structure uh, fairly easily. And um, so for simple JSON, the tool may or may not be an equivalent tool to XML Mapper may or not be so necessary. If yeah, you like. I think, think the, the rest, real, the real, for example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but that, but that, the rest debugger is more about testing the data transfer. Yeah, but there were there are some components in there, and um, that, and I'm sure that I well I know because I've sat through them. There are webinars out there that were that were very interesting for JSON users. The there's one that that JSON's quite a flexible structure basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's uh, that has pros and cons, of course, when you're working with it. But for very simple, um, small amounts of data, it's a good, it's perhaps a good choice. One of the things that's sort of driving the XML forward still is that it's it it does provide the schema approach, which I touched on in the in the in the presentation there. And the schema is a formal way that's very accurately defined the structure of a schema that that specifies exactly what the data. In, in the corresponding XML file can contain and and also what what it, therefore what it can't contain because if it contains anything that's not in the schema uh, the the jargon term is it's not compliant but therefore your software is entitled to um, not handle it very well at even I mean it would be nice if it doesn't fall over but you but you certainly not handle the data that that's in there if the schema doesn't specify it so so one one area that, uh, that where that's um, employed is is this electronic invoicing. Many governments in the 
in the world. Actually, strangely enough, more it's more um, it's further advanced in the in some of the Latin American countries than than some of the European ones and the states. But there's, the governments are producing schemas that that are very complex documents because they cover all all sorts of possibilities that an electronic invoice can have. Mm. And if you want, it's getting to the point where if you want to work for the government, you have to submit your invoice according to that schema. Well, if if you're um, if, if you haven't got the ability to do that, you're not going to get the job, or you might get the job, but you won't be able to charge for it. Well, for, so for so you know, that. that's the type of application where the XML map is going to it is does come into its own. Well, Helios, which is I've just put up a question, or not a question, but more a comment, really. And um, Helios says that that in fact is a very nice and useful presentation. Thank you, Roger. Um, and say, so, and they then follow it up to say actually it's something they've needed for years. And I, I think this is the point that um, XML is one of those things where you go, oh, you know, it's data and it's. But actually, you know, the, the thing about being a, a developer is that you spend an awful lot of time playing around with things that are not terribly exciting. I mean, user interfaces and, and uh, you know, things that go whoosh and click and bang and pop uh, are all very exciting. But the reality is, as a software developer, the majority of your time is spent uh, converting data, processing data, reading it, writing it, and, and uh, updating it. So um, whilst it may not be the most um, glamorous thing in the world compared to some graphics library or a sound generation library playing the uh, sounds of a natural French horn for example um it, it, which are the you know the sonorous tones is what I'm looking for uh it is actually key as you say to many places and particularly in Latin America uh and we have a very strong following in Brazil for example uh extremely strong they're, they're, they're like one of the biggest regions in the world Japanese are also very strong oddly enough um and i don't know it's something to do with you know the way they they uh, uh historically promoted the product but um you know latin america very definitely a very strong uh showing there and yes that is something that they come across um okay uh, helios it's, uh, it's nice of you to make your kind comment just one thing i would say is that something i needed for years is what is your statement mm -hmm. but actually as i pointed out in the presentation it has been around for years it just hasn't had much publicity and it's tucked away in the in the um tools menu where you might not think of looking it's been uh, the cinderella tool of the product yes. as what it is there's a few of them around a little bit the um, other one having said that the the older versions uh, uh, until until recently it has lagged behind a bit and there's been some some aspects of xml that it uh, that it's less strong on that have and and so that's another reason why I emphasize if you're going to start using it, everybody, make sure you download from GitHub and maybe like always with all, all software, keep checking that you're using the most up-to-date version. This was this was a, an MVP project, am I right? I, I think I, I believe that you, it was MVPs that actually worked on this particular project. Is that right? He's zoned out, you see. Uh, I, well, I'm... I have a problem with NDA. I thought we were under NDA. Ian. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I see what you mean. I don't think that it's secret about that. But yeah, okay. I mean, I I thought that the the um, XM... I think when we signed up, we weren't supposed to admit that it existed. So see, um... see, see my little badge there. This one. Yep. Um, I tell yep. you, you you explain. You you feel free. Do feel free to explain uh, what's they, they going can on. Go and drag me off. I'm pretty certain we can do that. So, um, I'm sure actually Mark uh, has probably mentioned it as well. Um, has never been great. Miguel doesn't seem to think it's. Uh, I, actually, I managed that project, so uh, you know, I guess I've just uh, uh, released it into the wild. Um, okay, so couple of questions can you convert a json file to an xml file um you can't with this tool but there are ways of doing it um so the answer is no um not directly the other question as well that uh, i don't know the answer to this so maybe you could answer this can the xml mapper write to a certain cell in an xml file as well that's not okay uh, for. there's two questions there i'll just come i think the um json to xml task sounds easy but one of the one of the without an xml schema 
you need to find some way of defining exactly which bits of the XML uh, definition you're going to use to store your data. And there are there are several, there are at least several, could be lots of ways of doing that. So the JSON to XML sounds a trivial task, but actually to specify exactly what you want the XML file to look at would be would would require a bit of design. So any such tool is not quite as trivial as you might expect there. And having said that, I can't remember what the other question is, Ian. <laughs> uh, can, can, it write, <laughs> can it write to a oh, yeah. cell in it? Yeah. I think what you the way you do that is exactly the same way that you would write to a single cell in a database. You would you would read in the record, you would edit the record, and then you would write write the record back as an XML um, file again rather than actually editing it at the text level i think well, that, that, so yes you could you that'd be the way i would tackle that problem yeah and that actually miguel is uh miguel is, is another person that, that is associated with this project and uh, he has come back and saying um basically the same thing unfortunately xml mapper documentation has never been great or detailed and i think that's absolutely a fact um i did actually um put a qr code up to the um documentation so it's up in the um the corner there and i know i'm pointing to it correctly this time because i'm pointing away from my badge and um <laughs> it takes a little bit to get used to but uh, if you scan that, you'll go to the documentation uh, link for the XML um, mapper docs. Uh, but yeah, we're aware that it's a little bit um, lacking, and and uh, you know we want to improve on that. The other thing is there's no documented way to use XML mapper with FireDAC until now, is what uh, Miguel says. So uh, you guys know more about this than me, actually. Funnily enough. Um, I use FireDAC, but not that often in comparison to some of the other things I do. I, I work on some very weird projects, uh, development projects, and um, funny enough, FireDAC doesn't come up that often on this particular project. Yeah. I'm stuck in it. So, the, I mean, the XML Mapper, as it as it stands, reads data into T client data sets, um, or at least the transform that you generate with the tool does. But it's, as I showed in the video, it's a very easy, easy step to to move the data across from the T-Client data set to FireDAC. So uh, so strictly, it doesn't support FireDAC, but that's absolutely no barrier to using it with a FireDAC application. And I'm I'm sure everyone knows that FireDAC is the, is the tool of choice for using databases from actually from quite some time ago now. Yeah. And, and actually, someone was saying when they asked about the JSON mapper, um, the thing about JSON is that there are actually lots of libraries that will um, convert to and from objects and, and JSON objects as well. So actually, in some ways, um, you can already do more natively with JSON because JSON is a more kind of nebulous thing rather than XML, which is more intended like a data set. So XML tends to be either um you know some structured text type data like a uh, xhtml type uh thing or it is actually a data set json can be objects and xml isn't really quite the same thing you know comparing the two yes they are similar but they're not identical i mean correct me if i'm wrong but they're, they're they have crossover but there is uh, there are some parts where they diverge the key thing for me that i like about xml as you point out is the um the uh, the mapping and the fact that you've got this um document that documents the xml that's probably the layman's uh, way of saying it um so that you can translate those uh, columns and say this column here should only have this in it should look like this it should perform like this and all, all bets are off. <laughs> uh, you know, you can pull in a JSON object um, that is supposed to be an employee record, but it could contain, you know, a, a recipe for um, rabbit stew or, um, you know, the, the list of fishes that can kill you uh, that are bigger than six feet long because there is no, no kind of equivalent of an XML schema in JSON. Uh, and actually, it can be a problem. But it is widely 
um, use. And that I think that's a side effect of it being based on JavaScript. You know, JSON uh, is a JavaScript object of notation. That's where that uh, acronym comes from. So um, good stuff. Um, and you asked me as well uh, in the chat where people are coming from. And I said all over the place. Well, just to make you feel happy, hello from Ecuador. Uh, so Ecuador, we've had literally today Libya, Ecuador, um, uh, and then uh, the Netherlands, which is not quite as far away from you. I mean, you could almost swim there if you were a strong swimmer. Um, you, where are you based? You're based in uh, England? We're in, uh, we're in the south southwest of England, a lovely part of the world. Oh, so you don't want to swim to the Netherlands then, because that's actually quite a distance from uh, you. <laughs> You'd have to go around the bottom and, and around with uh, I'm a London. It's quite a busy, that's quite a busy shipping lane to swim across. I, yes, I speak yes. to the, Oh, see, the, we'll start yeah. going all British and everyone will freak out if we start talking. I was born in, uh, in uh, uh, South London, actually. I was born in Woolwich. So, uh, you know, when people start, I, I'm, obviously I live in Dallas now. I'm married to an American. I'm an American citizen. But I, as you can tell by my accent, after 14 years, I still haven't lost it. I still sound relatively yeah. british i occasionally slip up and say a few american things but uh it's uh, fun okay well um plenty of uh, uh chats uh going on and surprisingly we we did quite well for the time um martha uh we've got a gap of eight minutes uh, i don't know whether yeah. she's listening. okay just i just would like to point out helios comment there that he's saying the uh the financial uh, transactions in Croatia are now on XML ah, using schemas. So that there we are. Thank thank you, uh, Helios, for that. Right. Um, so there you go. I mean, that's a case in point, really, um, where we were talking about um, really the driving force being finance, of course. It always is. Um, but it's an exchange format. And that's really the, the, the main point about this, that, XML is used as a way of translating, uh, you know, transmitting data around where it doesn't rely on some underlying database technology to drive it. it. You know, if you were to store all this information in a MySQL database, for example, you would need another MySQL database, probably of the same version or similar version, with, you know, all sorts of other um, settings to be correct, so that it's using, say, the same uh, language settings. Otherwise. Uh, you know, when you read your MySQL data in, you'll get weird characters appearing if it's come from Japan or something like that. Whereas XML ensures that the data between the two is, first of all, easily transmittable. You can even zip it up and email it if it's small enough. And, uh, you know, it can be held on almost any server without any underlying database server. You're not going to use it as a relational database, but you could. Uh, and that's the thing. That it's a data interchange format that is agreed on. JSON, not quite yeah. so so uh, well, and that's that's the difference. I think you cover that pretty well. Yeah, um, yeah. and also you can get editors that uh, that are uh, have a plugin or or designed to support XML, which which displays it on the screen in a in a nice user friendly um, indented approach that's another uh advantage they may do that for json too i don't know yeah joe carney i don't i, I haven't googled this to check what what they're saying but joe carney says mm. json was invented by google to reduce the overhead of xml was it okay, yeah XML. I, well i'm not sure who invented it there is an argument that xml is a bit uh, verbose uh, and certainly for simple for simple amounts of data compared with json uh, that argument would be sensible these days, with ever increasing bandwidth, it's arguably less important. So, yeah, and are all of the FD components discussed and presented in the available in the pro version? Uh, Ian probably knows the answer to that. But if you, whenever you've got any <laughs> doubt about that, what you need to search for in Google is the feature matrix. Right. And it took me five years to know what the right thing to find that page. That's always always there but always hard to find in any new version. So if, if you search Embarcadero feature matrix and then the latest that. version, that's can, a useful tip from yeah, me. I can do better than that. Um, what I will do is I will okay. go to our little captions thing and I'll go in here and I will uh, add one to here and say like this and then add and then see it's uh, like this. And there's your feature matrix. So yeah. if you go to that URL, then uh, you, you will uh, yeah. get the feature matrix. Um, the answer is that the pro version does do local databases. Are these um, 
are these FIDAC components that can do this? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. But um, the feature matrix does talk about um, FIDAC components being available in the pro version, but they are only for local database connectivity, not client server. Now, the question is whether someone somewhere has decided that being able to uh, handle XML is a client server function. I actually don't know is the answer. Um, so go on the feature matrix and look it up and then come and let me know <laughs> is, uh, is the answer. But um, it generally, you know, the pro, the pro version is very capable. And, uh, you know, it's it's not like a crippled version. It's just it's an appropriate version for certain people's level of uh, um, connectivity requirements and things like that. But once you start looking at big client server databases or even medium or small client server databases, then that's when you need to be looking at the enterprise version. And you've got everything you need with the enterprise version. Architecture is even further on from that because it's got um, modeling support, I think, and a few other things as well that I would personally not use. So. So there you go. So we're doing well, uh, Roger. I, we thought we would have bags of time left over, but actually we've only got two minutes left. So, uh, we've done very well, I think. Um, yeah. Let me just uh, hide that. Let's get rid of that, and let's go to the chat, make sure we've covered everything. Yes, I believe. Okay, well, I probably ought to, I, if we're winding up, I ought to just reply to the question about do you need to inhale to play the natural horn? <laughs> and it's all about breath control, yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, actually, so, yeah. I used to play the trombone, and uh, yeah, we well, all know. You all yeah. Know. So it's it, it, the weird thing is, people always go, oh, "God, you've got a very loud voice." And uh, yeah, I have. I'm probably a little bit deaf as well, or much deaf, should I say? Uh, but uh, but actually, it is about the fact that uh, I played it from a very young age. And one of the exercises that you have to do for playing a brass instrument, as I'm sure you know, Roger, is about uh, controlling diaphragm and being able to expel air in a way that's controlled and, and forceful. Plus, you know, I've uh, been a DJ and, a, a, you know, voice actor and a few other things as well. So I project anyway. But I think uh, I personally blame the trombone. That's my, that's my, uh, I'm sticking with that because you, it's the same thing. You've got this slide and it's yeah. not, you know, there's no look, little, um, uh, you know, valves or anything like the trumpet players, they've got it easy. They they can choose the notes, whereas with the natural horn and with the trombone, we, it's a little bit more uh, hit and miss. And it's, I feel like it's more skillful, don't you? Yes, the embouchure, that's the one, yeah. Excellent. Well, um, thanks Great. a lot. I appreciate your, your session. Um, very helpful. And I like the map behind you as well, which I always comment on when I see it. And um, I'll be talking to you soon. But now uh, we're going to go on to the next session. Um, don't worry, don't panic, Martha. But um, I'll say goodbye to Roger. Thanks very much.